let's start off with what we always start off with, the word authenticity. When you hear the word, what does it mean to you? Sure. I mean, authenticity to me, everyone has different flavors. I think it's about presenting yourself in the way that you want to at that moment. So it's it's a spectrum. What's your authentic today could be different as what your authentic was 10 years ago is different what your authentic is going to be in the future. Interesting. And I, I get that. I mean, humans, we grow, we evolve, we pick up different things. Talk to me about maybe 10 years ago. Like, what did that look like for you? Yeah, I mean, it's hard because maybe 10 years ago, damn, aging myself, probably in college, I think, at that time. College is always a point of transition. You go from high school, big dog, you go to college, your world changes. I'd actually, I didn't know what types of cultural groups I can get into, for example. Like, do I go into the newspaper group that has a certain demographic that I hang out with the Asian kids, which I did at a time. That's part of my background too. Did I hang out with the Latino kids? Did I hang out with like the black groups? I definitely said I can't step. So that was like, that was done for me. I couldn't <laughs> do that. Um, so, I mean, 10 years ago, not sure who I want to be, not sure who I want to associate with. And that was who I was authentic to myself because I didn't want to try to pose and try to be one way or the other. Interesting, but going into college, yeah. You know, I think you mentioned like certain cultural things, but also just certain like professional career aspirations. You mentioned the newspaper. Like, were you a big writer growing up? Uh, writer growing up? No, it's interesting, right? And even today, even though I'm like doing my doctor in this thing, I wouldn't say I'm not a certain type of writer. Now, if conversational, we're good. We like it. Now, when you want me to act like academic, not so great. But the thing that was interesting was. The, uh, the newspaper, so shout out to the Vector and GIT, they weren't in the greatest spot. Like the, the faculty advisor would be like, yeah, they're like typos, the language wasn't great. So oddly enough, I didn't write too much, but they brought me on board to like, just edit the crap out of it. And it's like, no slight anyone there, but that's like, it was wild. I mean, if you ever been in newspaper, everything is like the rush of production. So the Monday before it went out on the Tuesday, We'd be in there from like 8 p.m. sometimes till 2 a.m. just like hammered out these papers. So I can yeah. make other people's words good. My words? Yeah. Why do you think that is? Like, is it hard to get your thoughts out in general? Is it because I think even like there's entrepreneurs where they're really good at having the initial idea or even being comfortable and confident that their idea is going to resonate with a lot of people. But then there are others where they're just like, listen, I'm really shy with my life. I don't want to put that much out there, but I'm really comfortable helping other people with their work. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't know if you do like the Myers-Briggs, the Strength Finder, all those things. So my profiles as they've been coming out, I'm like a mix between a provider and a creator. And so that's like that mix where like, it's just part of who I am. I try to make things better. I don't know if I can roll that back to how I was raised in the Hispanic household. You're always looking out for the family, you're looking out for the the family friends, which are basically family. And so, yeah, I mean, for me, I feel more comfortable giving than, I guess, putting myself out there. Interesting. That's fascinating. Tell me a little bit about that family dynamic and growing up in that Latino household. How do you think that has impacted your authenticity? And again, no slight on anybody. I think there are certain expectations. So relatively new in terms of generations, my grandparents immigrated to the United States. You always want people to be better. Mm -hmm. And for one way or another, like the narrative came out that like AJ is going to be the first one to go to college and get this good job. He's going to make everything better. So maybe it's like, I don't want to put myself out there and risk damaging the image that was being cultivated mm -hmm. for me. Yeah. And, and it's wild, right? Because I can put my age out there, but I'm not that old, but I have people like 10, 20, 30 years ago or older than me. So 10, 20, 30 years older than me saying like, I'm a role model to them. And that puts like a certain pressure, especially if you're not even an adult, like you're like 13 people say looking out to you, like, <laughs> I don't even know who I am. How am I, how am I a role model to you? You're like a, a prophet that's going to like save the whole community. Yeah. Well, how does that make you feel early on, even like hearing some of those things or like, did you even pay attention to it? That's where it's hard. Um, so I don't know. So they're there. And I'll probably put this out earlier. Maybe this will be a spin later on in the conversation. But I only recently found out maybe within the past 
year or two that I actually have certain disabilities for like audio processing and attention deficit. So what I can say is like, I'll hear things in the moment. I may not fully understand it, but it may come back to me like three weeks later, two, like four months later. So what, I'll, what your answer to that is, I think I heard it and then like percolate in the back of my head and then that like sort of changed me. But like in that moment when somebody said it, people be like, are you listening to me? Do you hear me? I did, but I think my, my brain just had to take a bit more time on it. And when did you find that out about yourself? I found that about, like I said, maybe a, a year or so ago. Or, or how rather, how did you find out? Well, how did I find that out? I think the past few years have been like taxing to everyone. So I think people were sending me an article recently that like, I'm going to say the wrong people, but basically the, the head people in the United States, the doctors are, are all thinking that we should normalize testing kids at eight to 13 for anxiety because like adults are getting it crazy. And like, so I'll say for myself, I was having, I was having episodes. And so I was figured, let me go, let me figure it out. So around that time I started doing therapy for the first time, but I want to shout out both to therapy and to getting tested. Like, it's it's a whole weird thing like most insurance providers don't actually cover that so i mean that's expensive like i i showed my neurological exam to one of my primary doctors and like how'd you do this this thing cheap um i'll be honest there that one i got lucky so like i'm very much an advocate for paying it forward i got referred to this guy um i won't say his name i got referred to this very prolific um psychologist and he did this thing, like he's he's good in his career. He doesn't really need to do anything. He says, every 10th person who comes to visit me, I give them the test for free. God God was with me or something. I was that 10th person. And I was like, oh, thank you. Um, but that's that's how I found out. I figured out, I, I, was, I was like, I feel like something's going on. Um, I'll even say I had, a, I actually had like a straight up like anxiety attack. So fortunately, I had like an Apple Watch and like it was telling me, it's like, bro, you, you're an AFib right now. Your heart rate's all over the place. You're like, so I was like, I got to I got to do something about it. I, and it's unfortunate, right? Because if that's something that was normalized and kids had that growing up, they wouldn't be in that situation because maybe they would have learned coping mechanisms or, or something to not get to that point. Tell me, tell me about that experience, even with the Apple Watch and, and what was happening. And I think that's really interesting right because i think oftentimes we go through certain like anxiety inducing or traumatic experiences but so because we don't talk about them openly we yeah. think like we're the only ones experiencing them yeah i often tell people like it's really important to talk about our experiences because you want to let someone else know that they're not alone right because when we feel like we're alone we feel like we're the problem yeah. or not the problem it's either like um, mental, physical, or just like society level issues, right? So that Apple Watch is probably that first time maybe where you have a secondary source telling you like, no, 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 I'm not crazy. Like there is something happening right now because you can literally see the numbers going up, right? Yeah, you know, that's exactly it. And it's powerful too. I mean, you, your background, my background, numbers, everything. Like yeah, that, that gives you the proof because I even told you too, like sometimes I question like, I'm not perfect. My memory isn't, it's not infallible. So no like, one is. Yeah. So that's where like someone, and that's, uh, I don't want to get to like the conversation where people get gaslit or something. Like people be like, was something really wrong? Or were you ma were making it up? Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. you, you took it the wrong way, but like facts are facts. You know, my heart rate crazy. My watch said chill. That's, that's facts. So what was, what was that experience like when you had that, um, panic or anxiety attack what was happening yeah that i'm comfortable talking about it. so i didn't really know what to expect i mean it was it was shortness of breath i couldn't get the words out tears were coming out like i couldn't even control it um fortunately i live with my fiance she was here she's comforting me she said you're good you're all right i called my pops he was working he dropped what he was doing I don't, I, I'll just be honest, I don't think I can get into the details of it, but basically it was a lot. I mean, it was work, it was stresses I put on myself trying to do my own doctorate. It was, I mean, it's everything 
everything you can think about because it's like what you said, if you don't talk about it, it just keeps building up and building up. And so I was trying to be that rock. I was trying to be that role model. And so I can't let people, I can't let people know the cracks. And if you don't deal with that, the cracks just get bigger. I think you've alluded to a few different things, right? Like even like you getting your doctorate and working and trying to do all these things, it's like the pressure that you put on yourself to um, be the role model, et cetera. Like I have friends that are gay they have a boyfriend like this guy that i know has a boyfriend and he got his mba only to to make his family proud enough to the point where they would accept his boyfriend like that is and no one told him that it's not like his dad or his mom was like i only accept your boyfriend if you get an mba right but in his mind he told himself like i'm gonna do this and hopefully they'll accept me you know what i mean like we tell ourselves and put so much pressure on ourselves because of the acceptance that we crave from like so many people and often like our family right but i think academics is even like different from work because work i think a lot of pressure comes from that too because it's how we make a living it's how we pay for rent it's how we even support our families beyond just making them proud right so talk to me about like when you first started working like what sort of pressures did you think about going into it yeah when i started working i mean it's, it's a hard time so i was of the same situation a lot of people had. My first jobs around the time where like economic co collapse happened in 2008, nobody was hiring. And so I literally had to make my own jobs. I mean, my first job was, I started my own consultancy, went out to just random ass people in New York and said, hey, I'm here. I see you got a problem, I'll solve it. And that's like its own debacle because Shout out to you sharing like your salary the other time, but nobody was doing that in 2008. And so I had to make stuff up. I mean, you charge charge $10, $20, yeah, yeah. make up numbers until somebody says you're bugging. But then <laughs> you're bugging, the next guy says, oh, that's cheap. So like, you don't need, you gotta figure all that out plus, and then some. Yeah, but was, were you sort of like proud of the work that you were doing like or were you sort of like insecure about like telling family and friends about some of the work that you're doing that's a good question and so the, the reason why i pause and i'll say yeah. i'll say this because i right now am insecure about the work that i do like i have friends that would be like yo you you're helping me this this and that but even like if i go on a date I'm like insecure to say I run my own company versus I, I work for TikTok. Like I used to be excited to tell people that I worked for like these big names, you know, even family. Like I would say I used to work for Facebook and like everybody knows what Facebook is. But now I have to explain what Plural is. You know what I mean? I can relate to that. So the reason, the reason why I paused is I was trying to think back on the situation. So if I go through like the timeline of events, like if if I'm going to get a new contract, I'm going to get a new job. Mm -hmm. I was very hesitant to tell people about those prospects until it was locked in and not even like super locked in until like I actually got that paycheck because there was always like the anxiety or fear that like, let's say, you know, I got this opportunity, that opportunity fall through because we all know these things fall through. Yeah. But people don't really want to talk about that, especially like if you have a certain brand or image. I mean, that's something I heard you talk about on your previous podcast. You got to try to maintain that image and so you can't let people know if if unless it's unless it's locked in so that that's how i think i felt there you are like building your own business and consulting firm and that takes a lot of like guts audacity there must have been a, a certain level of confidence that you sort of left that experience with as you moved on to you know the economy getting better and you moving into some more corporate roles talk to me about like some of those early corporate roles that you had how did you look going into it because there's data out there that says three out of four latinos at work suppress parts of their identities and it often starts with appearance based like were you intentional how you showed up i'm trying to think about different times so the way you see me right now so anyone who's like just listening to audio i got on my college shirt i got my vest i mean that's that's my brand right now especially i mean maybe it hit on a few decades later my mom's saying like take pride in yourself like you got seen seen vergüenza club that that means a certain thing but no, I think early on in the career, I didn't think about it as much. I think it was more as I got higher, I felt like I had to had to dress a certain way. Like, and I think it's also the jobs, right? Because some of those were 
like in the WeWork spaces and people just wearing t-shirts or whatever, they got beer taps. So that's a certain way. And you were, you were sort of like on the engineer product side. So everyone was like very casual. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you yeah. would go in there, like you didn't feel like you had to shave, you could wear whatever you want sort of in, in those early roles. In the early roles, I think so. Yeah. Right. Because I don't know, maybe we sometimes get in our own heads. Like mm -hmm. there was no pressure. So like I wasn't in finance. I wasn't around people wearing like suits and ties. And uh, I didn't feel that pressure. I shall give this example. And people will say this all the time. So not to be cliche, but around the time of George Floyd, when everyone had this certain mindset, I made I made a pledge to myself that I was just not going to cut my beard. I was just going to let it grow out for as long as it did. I saw you showed one of those pictures where it was wild. I have that too. My fiance doesn't want me to show it to anybody. It was wild. But I had it for a while and I was like trying to find new opportunities and, and promotions and some things were falling through. And I had a chance to talk to this one company, ERG. And I don't, like I said, there was George Floyd and everything into it. And I was like, I just let it out. It was for a Latino ERG. I said, should I, should I cut this? Like, like, is that going to impede any chance for advancement? And a lot of people said, no, nah, I don't think so. But then this one person spoke up and this is the power of speaking out. And I said, well, actually I work with some children or not children, some teenagers, young adults that try to find jobs and uh, they're incarcerated and trying to find, like start up their life. And they said, the first thing is you clean shave, you dress up to the nines, because you can't give them the reason to take you out because you're Latino before you even step through the door. Mm. So, I mean, that is something for real. I mean, at the end of the day, I kept it, but that's what, so to answer your question, I think earlier on, I didn't think about it. Maybe it's just cause the, the culture wasn't at the point of talking about it as much, but as it became part of the dialogue, I think it became a conscious decision that I had to think about. <laughs> That's really interesting. And it's true. I mean, I remember my family telling me that growing up, I think even in college, I'm pretty sure like they told me that as well. I mean, and it wasn't like an attack on me. It was more yeah. so just like people trying to look out for us. Right. But I don't know, personally, like I am tired of me having to always do the adjustment. And like, I would want more so of the people giving that negative perception to me or that bias perception to really be educated on what they're saying you know what i mean yeah <laughs> it's interesting though that like as you move up that's when you start feeling more of the pressure or at least you start having more of the conversations in your head like why do you think like what's the correlation between the pressure and the more you move up is it that less and less people look like you as you move up are there certain things that, were, that have been said to you i'm just curious sort of why that dialogue has started so there, there are a few different ways, and part of it, I'm going to put a positive spin on it. Um, <laughs> and it's going to sound a little funny. It's, it, funny. it's We talked about as we grew up, we we change the image we and brand we cultivate for ourselves changes. Um, I used to have uh, an instructor and then eventually a co-worker um, who he used to wear a vest all the time, and I admired that. I thought he looked really sharp. And so I was like, well, if I like what he's doing, why don't I try doing that too? And the thing that where I said it's going to be funny is uh, it's no longer in the air anymore, but the show Black Lightning, the main character, mm -hmm. he was a principal and um, he would always dress to the nines. He'd, he'd wear like a three-piece suit and everyone knew this was like, he's, he's a professor, he, he's, he's cool, he's chill, he's a principal. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know, I kind of want to be like that. And it wasn't just for myself. It was also to go back to the narrative of like, if I take this mantle that people gave me that I'm a role model, and if I take everything that my parents and my families can tell me about like, take pride in yourself, let me spin it all together. So I can say right now is, I think I'm proud of the way I dress. It, it, it's a marrying of a lot of expectations and a brand that I have for myself. And, and I think people take notice. It was, it was surprising to me. So I used to teach uh, a master's program and it was only years later when some of the alumni went to just chat with me and follow up and they said that they always admired the fact that like regardless how everyone else was dressing the students or themselves i always dressed up and like rose to that occasion so that they knew that like 
they should give they should pay more attention to the material and then they recognize that everything i was saying and doing was for them like i tell them stuff that i don't think anyone else tells so part of the experience you said about making your own job you learn a lot of crappy things by trying to make make it for yourself in the beginning that no one tells you no one told me to negotiate portfolio right so you have so many designers out there that can't even talk about the work they did because they're contracts are like ironclad no one told me that in college i had to get to experiences where like i was trying to interview and they're like let me see what you got and i was like i can't show you nothing and so yeah. i mean that's part of it you 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 learn what people expect you rise to that occasion and then and then you have this dialogue you share they give you share they give yeah i think it's fascinating that your students tell you that they paid more attention to you when you dressed a certain way Right. And it kind of goes back to that recruiter that was working with formerly incarcerated people and giving them that advice. I mean, it's no surprise that our parents give us that advice around like dress a certain way, act a certain way. It's because like society has been trained to believe that like if certain, someone is dressed a certain way, then they are higher up in the ranks. They're a leader. Right. All of these things. Right. And I always say like, yo, there's nothing wrong with dressing up. In fact, I like dressing up. Everybody like dressing up. Right. But it's about like, what are you comfortable with? Right. Because some people hate dressing up, but they feel like they have to to just make other people happy. Like some people are really uncomfortable with a certain way of dress, but they do it just to feel accepted, listened to all those kind of things. Right. You know what I mean? So but it's interesting, like even your students are sort of like reiterating that point of like, yeah, I listen to people depending on how they dress, you know? Yeah, and I think what set it apart was there was no expectation that I had to be this way. It's that I chose mm -hmm. to do that on my own accord. So like when people like have this strong aversion to like ties and suits, it's because it's forced upon them. That's what I think. Mm -hmm. Like my the profile picture that I sent you I have a tie is because that's how I want to look at that moment. I don't want to look that all the way or all the time. But if I do it, it's for a reason, and I don't. I think that's just something I matured into. And that's probably what it was, right? So you said it and I said it. So like when my parents said you gotta dress a certain way, you're like, Ma, stop. But like <laughs> when you decided, hey, I wanna look fire today, it's different. It's like you making that decision based on what you wanna do, not because someone else is telling you. That's interesting. So tell me about a time when your authenticity was met with resistance at work. Because um I don't think it's always necessarily met positively and it's important to talk about those situations too that's another moment of just sort of owning who i am so a lot of times i think when i was being authentic like i said it was a spectrum of who you want to be at that time who aj wants to be maybe at the start of that contract and who aj wants to be like six months later could be radically different so mm -hmm. people are like why are you acting this way why are you doing this it's like because i feel passionate about this thing and i'm gonna I'm gonna stick to it. I know either because I have these credentials, I have this education, I have this experience that I know it should be a certain way. And people are like, why are you pushing on us? Like, because I feel passionate about it. And so that authenticity came back and people would like come up with these narratives, like too aggressive, too defensive. And so, I mean, that's, that is something that can happen. Um, and it's just working on it. I think somebody told me it's like a saying of slow, constant rain sort of like erodes some of this tension. So people know you're not going to change. I mean, something's going to happen either. But I'll be honest. So I'm not going to paint like a perfectly rosy picture. It may just not be a good fit and you leave or they leave. But if you stay consistent, something's going to change. Yeah. And, and tell me, you don't have to get into like obviously very specifics, but like in general terms, tell me about one of those situations where you were very passionate about a certain subject, there was resistance or pushback, you're like, no, trust me, y'all, like, I'm pretty sure like, this is how we should be doing it. Um, and then you unfortunately got a certain label like aggressive and just to empathize like, I've been labeled aggressive, it was unfortunate. But I think it happens to a lot of people. Once that narrative of being like, confrontational aggressive came into play, I started to make it a little bit of a game and I mean it like in a in like a malicious way. Everyone talks about allyship. I'll say like I had a white ally at the time and like 
from day one, I don't know. I, this is something I can't really describe. Some people tell me that like within like 30 seconds, they just knew like the competency was there. You got it. Like, I trust you. I can't explain why that's there, but that he was one of those people. And so when that narrative came out, I, I chatted them up. I said, you know, I'm going to try something. I'm going to say something that I know is right, is the right thing to do. And they're going to say I'm voting. I want you to say the same thing afterwards and see what happens. That happened. I got like interrupted. They say, AJ, we're not going to talk about this at the time. It doesn't make sense. Less than two minutes later, this ally says the same exact thing. Like, oh, that's so smart. Yo, we should do that. And I'm like, you wild. <laughs> you wilding right now. Also, oh, y'all had a plan going into it. Yeah. Because you were like, wow, that's fat. I love that. I, how did that make you feel at the moment? And what did you do? I don't know. So I don't know the stages of grief or denial or, or all that stuff. But like, I can't put myself exactly in the headspace. I mean, there's probably some like annoyance, like upset. It's probably a mix of like bad laughter. So like laughing because you know the situation is dumb, but it is what it is and you knew it was gonna happen. It's like um, one of those, what do they say? Like all I could do is laugh in this situation? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, maybe there was some relief in there because it, it similar to we talk about like the Apple Watch situation, this was like a concrete event that I can point to that proved that wasn't crazy and someone else to validate your story yeah. and experience. Yeah. I'm I'm curious, like, I'm sure going into it, y your friend was probably like, AJ, come on, you bugging. They're not, if, if they don't listen to you, they're not gonna listen to me. Like, he probably didn't even believe you until it happened. He was like, whoa, you were right. I think we both knew that was gonna happen. And this really? is this is one of the things that's that's powerful about, like, if you have a strong advocate or ally, I think I normalized some of this behavior that was put against me and so like what do you there mean were some red f so i normalized the fact that like i would be met with aversion or like conflicting energy and so like i didn't know how bad the situation was but an outside observer so this ally like he saw this was going well so this i can speak to too so another completely different ally I was on this call and like this actually happens a lot of times in my life nothing about it shit was going crazy like the project was at risk and i said you know what i'm gonna take it i'm gonna i even said it. i was like you know i'm gonna work for the next 16 hours straight i'm gonna get this done we're gonna have a conversation about it tomorrow on this 50 person call and i presented it and i can't even explain like what happened but this other i won't say he or she this other person like just raised their voice and started saying like like just stuff to me and i can't even remember what it was and it was actually one of my reports at the time he, he like chatted me up he said no one should ever talk to somebody else the way they spoke to you and i was like i didn't i didn't even process it. i didn't even like i was just like you know people just People just raise their voice at me, and that's just it is what it is. It took an outside observer to tell me that like, that situation was wrong. Yeah. I remember the first time I ever cried about a job, it was to my aunt, and it was like during the first year that I was working at, at Meta. And I was just telling her like how exhausting it was to like assimilate and like try to fit in and like try to be best friends with everybody. And she asked me such a simple question that it's like that experience, it kind of like snapped me into like, oh, this isn't like, I shouldn't be doing this, right? She was like, well, like, why are you spending so much time assimilating? And I didn't know what to say. I, the only thing I could say was like, I thought I had to. You know, like your situation, you normalize it so much, you were like, oh, I thought this is just what like work was like for everybody. Yeah. And, and I think what I could say on this idea of authenticity as a spectrum, 
I think you were being authentic to who you thought you were at that mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. So after they told you, your worldview changed, your definition of authenticity changed. So that's the thing that I would, I'm not going to say caution, but I would say like, if you think about it, and this is where I think some people feel bad and they like guilt trip themselves. Just because you didn't do something in the past doesn't necessarily make you a bad person, doesn't make you any less authentic. Yeah, agreed. I mean, I think I was trying to be the version that I thought people wanted me to be as well. Yeah. But that's the thing about authenticity. Like everyone has their own definition for it. And like, I can't tell you what an authentic AJ is. Only AJ can answer that question for himself because it's based on your experience, what you want to show the world, what you want to show people. Uh, and I think all of our life experiences help shape what that person is. Wow, I'm, I'm just I'm just pausing because I I'm, I'm pausing here and I can edit this, but I'm just like, that's such a that's such a great game or like test that people can do at work. You know what I mean? It's it's like having an ally or a witness with them in a meeting to witness, to confirm, to validate that we're not crazy, that like these things yeah. are happening. Because I think. It's not only because I think we sometimes not only need to convince ourselves that we're not crazy. I think we sometimes need to convince other people that we're not crazy and yeah. convince people that like these experiences are real. I'll give you an example. Like I go on a bunch of speaking engagements and when I share this stat around Latinos suppressing parts of their identities, how it's 76 percent of us. People always say, oh, yeah, Pavel, but that is in like it must be in like Alabama. It's yeah. not going to be in New York can't be here. We offer this, these amazing perks and benefits. And I'm like, oh, you don't know the real life of your, you don't know what it's really like to work here yeah. as a person of color. Like, you don't know, you don't believe it. And it takes some of that experience sharing to, to actually get an understanding and to build empathy for the things that we go through. Yeah. So in the, in those situations, how did you then of, or eventually build up the confidence to continue bringing your most authentic self to work. I'm gonna say something and I'm gonna challenge it real quick. It was, it was positive, it was validation and positive affirmations. The reason why I'm gonna say challenge positive affirmations is because I just spoke to my coach this week. The work that I'm doing, he's like, this is God's work. It's like the fact that you're trying to help these like disadvantaged and marginalized like children and populations is God's work. So the reason why I said I'm challenging it is because I said, thank you for those positive affirmations. He's like, no, don't call it that. You're cheapening it. So I didn't even know positive affirmations had a scale. So he was telling me like, no, I'm giving you more than positive affirmations. I'm telling you straight fire right now. The way I got confidence was, I don't know what the word is for it, but receiving those positive affirmations plus plus. So I had a team of like 16 people. I've had many teams over, over the years, but a few of them recently told me I was the best manager they ever had because the things I was doing, I was listening to them. I was figuring out, I, the first thing I would do is ask them like, where do you want to be? And I would make a path to get them where they wanted to be. So like this guy wants to be a manager. So I said, I have a few of these calls. I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to alley you and you just, you just dunk it. And that then gave them political capital to grow. I had another person, she was uh, she was in QA and she wanted to be a developer. So then I put her in front of teams and I like got her in the place she needed to be to be able to fulfill that thing she wanted to be. So that's where I got the answer from her. And it wasn't just her, I mean, there's an other person who he was an architect, very profound. I'd say like he was one of the one of the brightest people I've ever worked with. And he gave me, again, those positive affirmations plus plus saying just like working with you has been a pleasure. You gave me like greater confidence. Um, I never managed a team before, but I, I said it and you heard it and it made it happen. And I don't even like that guy didn't even think he made a big deal of it, but like I heard it. And I mean, we know corporate America, it can be slow. It took a couple months, but I got these people these opportunities. So the confidence came from people telling me the things that I was doing was, I guess in some cases, life-changing. Curious because you mentioned this early on about your um, 
diagnosis around attention. Yeah. I'm curious, like, in your work, is that something that you bring up proactively? Is that something, like, how, how is that, is, is it even a conversation that is ever had? It only actually happened at, a, I think, a, in a public forum, it only happened, I think, this week. So I was given an opportunity to speak to an ERG, and it, like I said, it's some, same thing I messaged you. I guess there's just a serendipitous like alignment of the stars or something like i am a hispanic with disabilities there is because each uh, hispanic heritage month like starts on the 15th mm -hmm. there is an intersection where national disability employment awareness month and hispanic heritage month overlap and i'm wow. talking i have two engagements when they overlap wow. so i was like i guess i'm talking about it uh, God, universe, whatever said, this is my job right now. I mean, speak about the people that reached out to you previously, right? Like talking about the confidence you said that you got from people telling you that you impacted their lives positively. You being representation during that overlap in those two months of, of you speaking, I'm sure people are going to DM you or going to message you and say like, wow, I didn't know someone that looked like me, someone that has a shared identity as me or shared identities as me is in the position, is leading a team, is doing all those things. How does that make you feel? There's there's how I feel in the moment, how I feel later. Like right now, I guess I'm being honest, I guess I'm getting a little goosebumps. So this is where, this is, I used to be friends with one of the chaplains of Princeton University. And um, I guess there's like that spiritual side in, in me right now. And like, I guess I'm getting like these goosebumps and I'm, mm -hmm. I don't know. I guess it's just the people I've been hanging out with recently. It makes me feel like, I guess I'm working towards something bigger. It, it And I don't mean it like, again, to be big headed or anything, but it, it makes me feel like the work that I'm doing is valuable. Um, yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot to unpack there. I mean, I'm. You brought up other things, so with like attention and all these things, there. It's hard to put into words. I think I'm I'm proud of where I got to at that moment. I am proud that I'm able to reach some semblance of like that role model position that people put on me or that I cultivated. And I'm proud of that person who reached out and spoke to me because that was a powerful thing for them to even speak. I mean, there's one thing to hear. It's another to like, to positively affirm. I guess it's just a whole bunch of pride. <laughs> AJ, I'm, I'm proud of you because I think being, in, being vulnerable about something that we may have been insecure about previously is powerful. And I think we often like, underestimate the power of that. Like I often tell people like, authenticity, being your authentic self is bigger than you, it's bigger than me, it's bigger than any individual person because the real impact of authenticity is the impact that it has on people that are watching you. Like someone's gonna go to that talk and they're gonna be like, well shit, AJ's talking about it, that means I could talk about it. Like this isn't gonna hold me back. If anything, it is what's gonna set me apart from everybody else. Yeah. Talk to me, last question, as we wrap up, what's the one thing that empowers you and continues to inspire you to continue being your most authentic self, even at work? I think the thing that continues to inspire me is the fact that like you, others are willing to have these tough conversations with me, but also be comfortable enough to speak about it in a way that other people can hear. Because it'd be one thing if it was just AJ and Pabella talking on a Zoom call together. But this is AJ and Pabella talking and putting it out there for the world or for anyone who else to listen. And I also want to make it known and explicitly say that I talked about attention. I mean, there's a whole spectrum of disabilities that exist out there. For If anyone can see the video, I very consciously put on my carpal tunnel wrist braces. I got a back brace. There was a time where I walked around with a cane. And so it's like... You don't know what people are going through and realize two things. One, if they shared that with you, that's that's some vulnerability on there. 
And two, if you reach out and talk to them about it and don't make them feel othered or ostracized, now you just built a connection that will grow between you and anyone else who sees that. Now I'm getting goosebumps. I appreciate you, AJ. Thank you so much. Thank you.